Feel free to testify with this song. I have somebody with me. Letter G. Letter G. That is Jesus. No others would be lonely when all their friends are gone. The Lord is never standing by my side. song of the church that goes along with my message today. In fact, uh, right here underneath the title, it quotes the verse I'm going to be preaching from, and that is, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. Did you say G? Letter G. Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. today to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 17. <clears throat> the 
title of my message sounds a little bit uh, intimidating, <laughs> but don't worry, we won't be here all afternoon. The title of my message is, Who is God? Who is God? It's a pretty broad title, but we're going to stick with one verse, and uh, hopefully we get through it today. I was speaking with a historian the other day, and I noted to him that we often learn a lot about history by simply carrying on an informal conversation with someone who lived through it. Uh, as we come to our text today, what we see is an emotionally overwhelmed apostle breaking out in spontaneous praise to Jehovah. And in this extemporaneous testimony we see here, we learn about God. And we learn that the God of the Bible is high above everything else, and therefore he deserves our praise. So I'll ask you to stand if you're able. And we'll just, whenever it's one verse, we read it in unison. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we approach a verse that some of the older preachers might have said we need to take our shoes off because we stand on holy ground. Help this preacher today to be filled with your spirit. And to bring this verse in a way that shows us who you are, what you are like. So that as we go through the coming week, we can think back and we can marvel at what we have heard today. The Apostle Paul is speaking here from his heart. And he's exclaiming who you are. Help us to feel the spirit of what he is saying and the spirit in which he is saying it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> I always like to put the verses that we preach from in context here. And so as we go back to verse number 12, we see Paul saying this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul here is thankful that in spite of his sinful background, Verse 15 says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. You know, we think about ministering as chaplains of a Red Onion State Prison. And we think about you have all kinds of criminals there, with all kinds of backgrounds. And yet, whether it's the worst criminal at the prison at Red Onion, whether it's the Apostle Paul, or whether it's you and me, we can say with the Apostle Paul, if we're saved today, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. You know, we were talking today in Sunday school in the book of James about the tongue and how that people stir up strife and how people have selfish ambitions and how people uh, want to lift themselves up by making other people look worse. But you know, there's one person that we know better than we know anybody else in this world, and that is ourselves. 
And so if we're honest with ourselves, who we were before we knew Christ, we can say with the Apostle Paul, we can say here, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. We see that not only did Christ save Paul, but he also called Paul into the ministry. Verse number 12. And he called him in verse 16 to be a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Jesus to life everlasting. Paul was saved, and the means by which he was saved, and how he was saved, and who he was saved through. He went all over the world preaching to others. I was saved, the chief of sinners. Christ will save you as well if you believe on him. So there goes Paul. He knows who he was, persecuting the church, blaspheming God. He knows who he was, but he remembers that Christ Jesus on the road to Damascus appeared to him. He was saved there that day. And not only was he saved, but he was called to the ministry. And I'll tell you what, there are a lot of things people get excited about. But this is what excited Paul. And he was so excited, he said in verse number 17, now. <laughs> he breaks out into a burst of thanksgiving and gratitude to God as he remembers God's mercy and grace towards him through Christ, in spite of his sinful past. He's amazed that God would save such a wretch, such a worm as him. And he's doubly amazed that God would call someone like him into the ministry to be an evangelist, Primarily to the Gentiles, to those who had no idea what the Bible was and what it was talking about. So he says, now, this is my reaction to these truths. Unto, he's talking about here, God. Who is God? Well, he begins this by saying, the King Eternal. This means the king of eternity, the king of the ages. All other kings that rule have a beginning and an end to their reign. I don't care who it is. But God rules throughout all ages and throughout all generations. He was ruling before time began. He will be ruling after time ends. God is the supreme ruler. He is the king eternal. Let's look at Psalm 145. Psalm 145. You know, there are different kinds of sermons that people preach. And sometimes you have what are called meddling sermons in which you get to a particular truth in the scripture and you try to show how we need to apply this to our lives. There are a lot of meddling sermons. This one is more of an adoration sermon. Let's see who God is and what our reaction to that truth ought to be. Psalm 145, the first 13 verses. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. What do we see here? Some of these characteristics here. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Verse number two. I will praise thy name. Forever and ever. Verse number four. One generation shall praise thy works to another. And that's what we need to be doing. Because we're not going to be around forever. Parents giving 
the name of Jehovah and His Son, Jesus Christ, to the next generation. And then that generation passing it on to the next generation. Praising His name. Telling what He is like from one generation to the next. Because the fact of the matter is, we may not like to face this truth, but we're going to pass off the seed. But God lives, endures forever. And we need to pass him on to the next generation. Verse 5. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts or awesome acts. And I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. This sums up in one verse what the King Eternal means. Thy kingdom, God's kingdom, is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The God of the Bible rules over a universal kingdom which has no beginning and no end. Generations of people and princes will come and will go, but King Jehovah reigns supreme. You know, we think about this world and all the players on the world scene. Putin. You know, the, the guy in China, Xi, uh, I guess is his name. You know, think about all of the world, these petty dictators who oppress their people. <coughs> Leaders here at home who don't honor God. And we think about all these things. And you look down the road 50 years. Most of these people are going to be in the grave and are going to be dead and are going to be getting ready to face judgment before the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that puts things in perspective for you because current rulers, you know, one day a ruler here on earth may want you to deny the faith or to deny parts of the Bible that are very clear. To do like they did in the Roman Empire. And say that Caesar is Lord. Instead of Christ is Lord. But you remember this in that moment. When you die for your faith. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. And that ruler who is asking you to deny your faith, he or she is going to pass away and one day stand before that same judge, that same king, that same Lord, Jesus Christ. Put things in perspective. God alone is the king eternal, the king of all the ages, the king of every generation. You know, you think about, you know, these young people. You think about the next generations. They don't need to learn primarily how to be successful in this world. Because you know what? The job that they may train to do in this world may be done away with. Okay? Our whole society, and it's happened over and over again, could be revolutionized to where... 
It's totally different. But they need to be prepared for eternity. To meet the King Eternal, the King of all the ages. No matter what people may be doing here on this earth. He is eternal. We see in our text, he is immortal. That word literally means incorruptible. God is not liable to decay, corruption, or decomposition. God will not die. Okay. Once again, this distinguishes him from all other earthly rulers. I don't care if a magazine puts on the front, God is dead, okay? He is not dead. Now everybody who writes that article and contributed to that article is going to be dead. Maybe dead even today. But God is not going to die. He rules through all generations. He will not die. He's immortal. Here's an interesting word here. He is invisible. The old theologian Adam Clark says this. He is one who fills all things, works everywhere, and yet is invisible to angels and men. This is the perfect reverse of false gods and idols who are confined to one spot, work nowhere, and being stocks and stones are seen by everybody. I like that. The things we see that we place our trust in, they're not in control. But the one who we cannot see is in control of everything. God the Father is too holy to be seen with human eyes tainted by sin. So if, if God is invisible, how do people know that the God of the Bible truly exists? Let's look at some ways in which people know. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now I remember hearing for the first time a preacher preach on this passage. The word hold there means to suppress. To suppress. God is angry against those who suppress the truth. Well, what is the truth? They're suppressing. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The invisible God can be seen through the visible creation. You know, this is why evolution is such a devilish teaching. Because it seeks to brainwash a generation of people into believing that we came from nothing and that everything is just pure chance. But a common sense child is going to look at creation, see a tree, and say, Daddy, who made that tree? <laughs> this is a common sense question. Daddy, who made the moon? This is a question that is a natural question to answer. Because of the intricacy and the design of creation, there had to be a creator. Because of the vastness of creation, there had to be a creator. I am looking forward. They put up a new telescope in outer space. I'm not scared of a new telescope in outer space. Was it the, uh, the James Webb Telescope? It's going to give us even further images than the Hubble telescope. 
which gave us amazing images. And it's opening up in outer space, and they said it's going to stare. I was listening to public radio. It's going to stare, and it's going to show us the origins of our universe. <laughs> Let me tell you something. They thought that with Hubble, too. And they took a little spot in the sky, and they pointed that telescope. And they's like, those aren't stars. Those are galaxies. That little spot in the sky. And there are galaxies everywhere. And my prediction is this. They're going to point at a spot in the sky, and guess what they're going to see? <laughs> galaxies everywhere because this universe is so big I think with the furthest telescopes we're not going to be able to see the end of it what does that show us we have a big God a big creator all glory be to him and you have to suppress that truth you have to hold down that truth you have to brainwash people away from that truth in order for them not to believe that there was a creator of this universe. And here's a sad part. What do people replace the creator, invisible God with? Verse 21 of Romans 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We watched The Wizard of Oz this weekend. And I, th I never noticed this before, the irony of this. But the, uh, the scarecrow didn't have a what? Didn't have a brain, okay? And so what did the wizard do for him? Did he give him a physical brain? No? I never noticed this before. He gave him a degree on a piece of paper. <laughs> it said, now you've got a brain. And the, 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 the lion didn't have courage. So what did he give the lion? A medal of honor. See, you're now a hero because you have a medal of honor. Now, you're not smart and you're not wise just because a school or a college gives you a piece of paper and says you're smart or says you're wise, okay? But this is where we're at. Follow the science. Believe the experts. But if they ever contradict this book, it says the one who says there is no God or acts as if there is no God is a fool. And we see this today, verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beast and creeping things. Instead of us seeking to be remade into the image of God, we try to make God into the image of man. That's exactly what we see happening today. But anyway, it's a little bit of a sidetrack. But how do people see the invisible God? Through his invisible creation. Through his visible creation. We see invisible God through the visible creation that he made. We saw the invisible God through Christ walking on this earth. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse number 14. And the word, which is Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. Because he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. 
to see Jesus walking in Galilee or to see Jesus riding into Jerusalem is to see an image, a physical image of the invisible God. It's an amazing thing to think about. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verses 14 through 17. In whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, by Christ, were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is, bef he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus was a walking image of the invisible God. Let's look at one more that kind of hits home. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Creation, visible creation, shows the invisible God. The visible Christ shows the invisible Father in heaven. In 1 John chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. There's that word so loved, just like John 3.16. But verse 12, no man has seen God at any time, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Jesus says in the Gospels, they, are no, they will know we are Christians by our love. Christian love shows the world what the invisible God can do in a person's life. 